I'm gonna tell you the truth about the Sony A9 III, the good and also the not so good. Big thanks to Sony Singapore, they provided the camera plus three lenses and also have the 51.2 GM lens as well, but they passed me the 16 to 35 F 2.8 GM2 lens, the 70 to 200 F 2.8 GM2 lens and the 100 to 400 GM lens. And so that was kind of my kit along with the 51.2 to give me a good idea of how this camera performs in a variety of scenarios. Now, I did a previous video, kind of a first impressions doing night photography at Chinatown around the Lunar New Year here in Singapore. Game changer is a term that a lot of people will say about this camera and rightfully so. This is going to change the way we see mirrorless cameras going forward in a big way. And the performance that once you get in your hands, you actually try it. This is a significant jump in technology when it comes to camera systems. And I think it's not just gonna be Sony that's gonna have a global shutter. We're gonna see other brands bringing it in and adding their own flavor to the image quality and to the dynamic range and ISO performance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are going to enhance the mirrorless systems far beyond what we have ever expected or ever thought of. And hats off to Sony for bringing this camera out. With that said, let's talk about the performance because that's what everybody's here for, right? One of the benefits of global shutter, of course, is that we're not getting that line reading up and down or that scanning reading up and down. It's bum, bum, bum. Every time it's taking a photo, that gives you up to 120 frames per second. Continuous autofocus, exposure, all that. It's the same power as like you're shooting a still image. You get it for 120 frames. And I can tell you this, we thought 30 frames was fast, and it is. It's blindingly fast, considering what we had a few years ago. But when you try 120 frames for the first time, and you see that counter going down and the buffer clearing in the camera, and then you load it up into Lightroom or whatever editing software, it's friggin' phenomenal. And the images that you can grab from this will be images that you probably only dreamed of getting in the past you can now get with this camera system in terms of, let's say, fast action or moments. I mean, even with people, where their eyes not open 100% or where their eyes close or where their smile just a little bit off and you're trying to adjust it in Photoshop if you're working with a client, whatever the case may be. Obviously, you want to be careful with those things, especially if they just missed that one image. With 120 frames per second, you're not going to miss the image. The autofocus is lightning quick. Is it perfect? No, no autofocusing system is. There's gonna be some misses in the system, even though it is the A9 III, it has a global shutter, has the most advanced autofocusing system by Sony. It's gonna miss, but for the most part, it nails it. It's friggin' phenomenal. Let's talk about some of the features in this. Of course, we know it is a 24.6 global shutter full frame sensor. The first time we're seeing a full frame global shutter in a camera like this in the marketplace. Now, global shutters, for those who shoot RED and other cinema cameras, you are quite familiar with them. But for a lot of people who've not shot with cinema cameras of that nature, you probably are very new to the global shutter experience and what it gives you in terms of benefits and what it may not give you in terms of benefits. And we'll talk about that later on. Now, it's not to say that it's perfect. There are gonna be some issues. We'll talk about that. But for the most part, that technology alone blew my mind over the past couple of weeks of using it. In terms of the EVF, we have a 9.44 million dot EVF, very reminiscent of what we're seeing in the A7R5, but it is a continuous high resolution EVF. It is bright. The colors look fantastic out of it. Of course, you can adjust the brightness however you want it to be, but it is so good to use, especially when you're doing wildlife or night photography or you're into, let's say, a lower light situation. The EVF shines. It's Sony's best. I also like the fact on this camera that every port has its own door. So on some camera systems out there, there are these rubber flaps and you have to peel it and then you have three or four ports respectively. And so hopefully other camera companies do adopt what Sony's done because I think that they've done a great job with that. Now, the funny thing about it is that when you start using it more so than not, you're gonna find that the buffer fills up relatively quickly, but you have to understand you're getting like two, three, 400 shots before the buffer starts slowing down. And I was doing this when I was capturing birds at the bird park, and I was holding the shutter down for you know a couple seconds, and then it would, it would go, kind of a thing. And it was, at first I'm thinking, oh, the buffer is not that great. But then I'm thinking, how many images did I just capture? Actually, it's not that bad. But we'll talk about the buffer in just a second because that gets into the whole CF Express Type A in terms of write speeds, et cetera, et cetera. Also, another feature in terms of performance, we got to talk about pre-capture. I like how Sony's implemented this. Now, I saw pre-capture in the Z8 and Z9 from Nikon, respectively. Now, that takes a while to set up. You have various different modes you can set it up in terms of times before and after. It can pre-capture an image, and it can be a little bit much. You would just want it to work. And I like the way that Sony's done this. It gives you up to one second before you capturing the images. It just grabs them, right? And you can see it happening you know, in your playback. And I just like that it's kind of a no frills, just turn on pre-capture and go. That alone 
is phenomenal for photographers. Then it's just the way that it handles all lighting situations. Now, will you ever get into a situation where you're not going to get any banding in lighting? No. I mean, yes, these things will still happen. There's still the, the, the rule of thumb where, of course, you got to match your shutter speed respectively, but you're not going to get the same sort of like rolling shutter look that you would get on other camera systems. It comes out a little bit differently. But for the most part, I was trying at events, you know, shooting, you know, LED boards and, and events out there and everything was pretty much clean. Only one shot on a mini would there be like some lines popping in, but that was the odd one out versus a common uh, scenario. And that's with anti-flicker turned on and turn off. I mean, that's the benefits of global shutter. Also global shutter will give you in terms of video is that you're not going to get any sort of warping or any sort of, you know, movement when you're doing fast action or fast pans. Now, if you are going to be doing cars, or you're going to be capturing animals, or you're going to be capturing something that's moving lightning quick, you have nothing to worry about with this. Everything looks fantastic. So these are some of the benefits of the global shutter. And of course, it's just the flash sync, which I didn't get to try on this, uh, this portion for the review because I did not have any flashes available and it was during Chinese New Year. So most of the studios that I knew were closed. Perhaps in the future, if I get the camera back, I can uh, test that out, but up to one over 80,000, it can sync in terms of shutter speed. Speaking of which, let's talk about that right now. The one over 80,000, there is a bit of a caveat on it. First and foremost, you can only reach that speed if you're doing a single frame, it will not work in uh, you know, the high burst modes. I mean, the aperture has to be F2 onwards. So it cannot be, let's say 1.2, 1.4, has to be like F2. Beyond that, then it will do a one over 80,000 shutter speed. Now you do need a lot of light for that. So if you're gonna be shooting in, let's say indoors, your ISO is gonna skyrocket, right? Probably max out your ISO. I would say that this would be used in bright, bright daylight, a clear sunny day in California or whatever country that you're in. That's when you can maximize this. But for the most part, if you wanna go you know, wide open on your lens, respectively, let's say the 51.2, that'll be one over 16,000. That's something to keep in consideration of because some people don't talk about that. They always say one over 80,000, but there are some caveats. Even Sony says it on their website, but I'm just putting it out there for you guys if you're watching this video and you're wondering, why can't I get that one over 80,000? How do you have to get it? I stop it down to F2 and beyond that and you can only use it if you're taking one single frame. In terms of the features in video, of course, we know 4K 120, there's no crop, 4K 25, 4K 30, 4K 60, you're there. You've got dynamic active stabilization in this, so this is gonna be great for a lot of people that wanna go handheld and you don't want to use a gimbal. You can get a lot of great shots using this camera without a gimbal, much more so. I mean, I think the ZV E1, if I'm not mistaken, actually has this uh, technology inside of it, which I remember from. So that's carried over here into the A9 III. So the, I'm glad that Sony's now bringing all these features from other camera systems and putting it into the A9 III, because that's been a complaint that a lot of people have been having out there is saying, well, my Alpha one that I spent 9,000 plus Singapore dollars, not getting a lot of these features, but now you're seeing it in the A9 III. And hopefully that continues forward with Sony camera systems. But the dynamic app, active stabilization is fantastic. I used it a lot when I was in Chinatown and I didn't need a gimbal. Okay, so let's talk about image quality on this thing. ISO dynamic range. This is the hot topic of this camera system, right? Everybody's saying, well, you know, I'm seeing these other reviewers and they're saying all the dynamic ranges and they're great and the ISO performance, it starts at 250. You can shoot at 125 on the ISO. And so, and I watched a couple of YouTubers saying, well, yeah, but the dynamic range is really, really bad on that. And I think it comes down to exposure. You know, for anything in photography, if you expose correctly, how much dynamic range do you need? How much, you know, latitude do you need in your image? Now, we all come across situations where we can't expose correctly and we're reliant on the camera to do these things, but there are various different metering modes inside the camera system. If you know that you're gonna be in a bright situation, you can go highlight priority on your metering so it exposes for the highlights. That means, yes, you're gonna, your shadows might be a little bit darker, but you can bring up some of that, which, this camera does really well. Obviously, when we talk about dynamic range, it's obviously to do with the highlights blowing out, but there's ways that you can adjust that. Is it worse than other cameras? So what I'm gonna do right now is show you a series of images. Not gonna tell you which camera is what, shot with four different cameras, all 24 megapixels. So we're gonna keep that in the 24 megapixel range because I believe keeping at the same resolution helps when you're zooming in. All these cameras are known to have very good higher ISO performance and good dynamic range respectively. And we're gonna shoot at the base ISO of A93. We're gonna shoot at 800, 4000, and 12,800. Now only one of the cameras that I've tested here does not have those exact numbers. And we'll talk about that at the end, but for the most part, all of them have mid-matched equivalently and we'll let you judge.
So as we saw right there, it's not that easy to tell, is it? Because here's the thing with Lightroom or any software that you use when you're importing images is that these cameras sort of give it the, the respective software its own recipe of how they want the images to be displayed in terms of noise reduction, color noise reduction, you know, sharpness, etc. So when you turn all that noise reduction off, you get to see the image for what it is. And the sharpness was the same, all of them the same at 40. That's how it is important in the Lightroom, but all the color noise reduction, luminance, all that was turned down. And as we saw, the A9 III actually handles its own relatively well. Now, in terms of the cameras, A was the Lumix S52X, B was the Leica SL2S, C was the Nikon ZF, and D was the A9 III. Now, the Leica was the only camera out of the bunch to not actually have the same exact ISO numbers because you just can't set into their camera system. It's always been one of my nitpicks with the Leica is that you really can't fine tune these numbers respectively. But every other camera was set at the same ISO numbers. The Leica will look a little bit underexposed versus the rest of them, but everyone's kind of playing in the same ballpark. So the A9 III tends to be a little bit brighter in the way that it renders the image respectively out of each of the ISO ranges. Now. I, when I'm shooting with the A9 III, what I do is I bring it minus like one over three on the exposure meter. So I just kind of bring that down a little bit and then it's kind of balanced out. But for this, I just kept everything at zero. But as you can see, the ISO performance is better than some cameras and slightly less than other cameras. So this is this whole ISO thing with the A9 III, I think some reviewers have talked about it respectively, but do I think it's a little bit overblown? Yeah, I do. I think that when you compare it to other cameras out there that you just saw, it holds its own more so than not. In terms of dynamic range, you will lose a little bit of dynamic range, slightly. Is it going to change the way your image is gonna come out or is it gonna make you less of a photographer? No. But let's talk about the build quality and design of this camera. Hands down, the best feeling Sony camera they have made to date. It feels so good in the hands. I have larger hands, right? And that was something I always complained about. And they improved the grips, you know, significantly with the a7 IV, a7R4, a7R5, respectively. This grip is even better than that. It feels so good in the hands, the rounded edges of the camera. It's subtle. You might not notice it that much in photos, but when you pick up the camera, you do feel it. It feels more comfortable in the hands, the buttons, the dials, everything feels solid. I love the flip out rotatable display like the a7R5 and the body feels lighter overall. Again, this camera is designed for speed and accuracy. That is what the A9 system is all about. It is not about having the best image quality. Yes, Sony said that image quality was not compromised and they're correct, it wasn't. If you're comparing it to other camera systems that have this type of performance, it is not compromised. If you're comparing it to an A7R5 or a medium format camera system or a 60 megapixel camera out there that is designed for high resolution photography, then yes, it is going to render the image slightly different. You'll probably get more dynamic range out of those cameras. If you want the best dynamic range, go get medium format. Get a Hasselblad X2D, a Fujifilm GFX 102, uh, Sony a7R5, and have at it with a dynamic range. You will see dynamic range for days. But if your reason for getting this camera is you want to capture a moment because your job depends on it, if you're a wedding photographer, if you're a sports or wildlife photographer, or even if you're an event photographer and you need to capture a pivotal moment, that's what this camera is designed to be. You're going to still get really good image quality and there's other software out there, Topaz Denoise, Lightroom has their own denoise option, other systems out there do it. And I'll also give you a little bit of a truth bomb. You see a lot of these wildlife photographers out there and they show all these fantastic images of these birds flying and the wings are just frozen in air or these animals running and they're just, everything's just frozen. And it's like, how do they capture that shot? How is it so clean? They're using software to clean up the noise because they have to raise their shutter speed so high to capture that moment. The ISO is gonna creep up. Of course, if you have ample lighting, you don't need to use that software so much. But if you're in overcast or in a shade or whatever the case may be, you're going to have to clean up the noise. So these photographers use these tools as well. I'm not discrediting the other reviewers out there that are harping on the dynamic range or ISO performance. Look, everybody has their own opinion, but I just showed you from four different camera systems that it's actually not that bad. Now, in terms of video, the base ISO, as they say, is ISO 2000, right? Well, you can shoot video at ISO 500. You're not going to get the same dynamic range as ISO 2000, 
but you're going to get less noise. You're going to trade off dynamic range for noise. So depending on your workflow, depending on what you're filming, you may think, hey, look, I want a very clean image. I can sacrifice maybe a stop or two of dynamic range. I'll shoot at ISO 500. It's extended ISO, but it still gives you really good performance. I'm shooting here at ISO 320. I'm not even shooting an S-Log3. I'm just shooting straight out of camera and the colors are fantastic. But to give you an idea, the image is clean. It looks great. I shot another video, uh, the Hassle by 907X video with the A93 and some people commented, wow, the video looks awesome. What did you use? These settings right here. So when you light correctly, you don't have to rely on all this dynamic range stuff. It only matters when you're shooting in certain lighting situations where you're going to need that dynamic range. If you're in post editing, want to bring down the highlights or bring or bring up the shadows, that's when this comes into play. But if you light correctly, which that's why when you're on a film set, they spend many hours lighting a scene is so they don't have to do all that kind of push and pull in post. They can pretty much shoot as they want it to look like, and they can adjust minor tweaks and there you go. So now that we talked about all that, let's talk about the not so good things about the A9 III. And I mean, we gotta be balanced here, right? The CF Express Type A card. Sony's had this history of really coming up with some interesting cards. Memory stick, anyone? You know what I mean? And they don't necessarily last in the marketplace because they're more proprietary to Sony's own products, respectively. And the CF Express Type A card kind of feels the same way. You know, Type B obviously is a larger card, but it is almost double the speeds. Actually, it is double the speeds in many ways of the CF Express Type A. When you're using a camera as fast as the A9 III, you really see the speeds or the limitations of the speeds of the, a, of the CF Express Type A card really come into play. And, that, and I talk about the buffering, of course, you're shooting a, a large number of images in a couple of seconds when you're using 120 frames per second, but it does take a while for that buffer to clear. And if you're a birder or if you're into wildlife photography or sports photography and you are pressing on that button to get that 120 frames because you know there's a pivotal moment happening and it stops, it's frustrating. I don't have another camera that shoots 120 frames with a CF Express Type B to say, hey, look, the Type B works better. But if you just look at the read and write numbers, it seems to be the case that it would. I did not use the Sony version, which is a very expensive card at 640 gigabytes. It's like... The price of a laptop, Sony, you could bring the price on a little bit, please. So I did use another company, Exascend, and that was a one terabyte card, which does help out, especially when you're testing on the A93. And the read speeds are 900 megabytes, sustained read speeds, and the write speeds are 850 megabytes, which are sustained write speeds as well. And this is faster than Sony's offerings currently in the market, and this card is substantially less in terms of price, but the performance is there. But yeah, after a few seconds, when you're on burst mode, 120 frames per second, you the buffering kicks in and look, it's a few hundred shots. I expect buffering to kick in. And I don't expect it to perform like a 30 FPS burst mode. But I do feel that Sony should adopt CF Express Type B. I mean, you're seeing the limitations already in terms of buffering. So hopefully they do in the future. Who knows? You know, CF Express Type B seems to be the default for most camera systems out there. And the write speeds and the, and the read speeds are much faster. That's one thing. Another um, aspect of the camera that I'm concerned about, and it's not necessarily a negative on this camera system because I don't know what they're firmware update cycle is going to be, but looking online and seeing a lot of the issues and complaints from a lot of customers out there, I, I understand the frustration where someone spends you know, thousands of dollars on a Sony camera, you know, which is a professional camera, only to not get firmware updates or getting cameras that cost a third of the price having more features in the camera that they spent five, six, seven thousand dollars on. I would say I hope Sony does improve the firmware updates going forward of these camera systems because there are some firmware updates that I feel could improve the system. I, I mean, I do feel that the autofocusing, it did miss sometimes. It wasn't grabbing onto the subject, especially with the 100 to 400. I don't know if this was a lens issue or a camera issue, but sometimes I just had to really like zoom all the way out, grab the subject and then go in. And it was quite severe, more than I've seen on other camera systems. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened. Sony, you know, hopefully you do update the cameras a bit more than you have been, especially for these pro cameras. I think it would give more confidence in the consumers that, hey, look, I'm investing in a Sony. I hopefully my camera will get these features because now you have the dedicated AI processor for autofocus. So that should increasingly improve over time. It seems to me that this camera has all the bells and whistles. So it's got pre-capture in it now. It's got all these great things, which are phenomenal. So hopefully that continues forward. With all that said, if you guys lasted this long in the video, thank you. I'm, I'm pretty much at the 32 minute mark at the time of this recording. I'll be editing this all down so it will be shorter, but there's no overheating sign if you're in case you're wondering, and I'm in my studio, by the way. I wanna say this for a lot of the 
fans of other camera systems out there. And there seems to be a lot of this, well, my camera can do this and my camera can do that. Oh, I don't need this. I don't need that. The image quality is not that great. Oh, the ISO, the dynamic range isn't there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm hearing these things in the comments. And I think we need to get away from this. My camera system is better than yours, or this camera system is better than this. I mean, do we own stock in these camera companies? Are we, are our families owners of these camera companies? No, we're users. I mean, for me, I judge every camera on its own merit when I do a review. And what Sony's done with the A9 III is pretty freaking amazing. Is it gonna get better? Of course it's gonna get better. This is version one. It's like the Apple Vision Pro. Like that's version one and it's gonna get better. Enjoy the technology, embrace the technology. It's awesome to see and to use. And Sony may not be your preferred camera system and that's fine. No one's asking you to buy it. But guys, let's relax on the fanboy isms. You know, let's just embrace the technology because sooner or later, all these cameras are gonna get global shutter. All these cameras are gonna bring improvements that even Sony doesn't even have to their camera system and vice versa. And that's the beauty of what we do using this gear, trying out this gear, experiencing this stuff. We're in a really good era of photography right now. AI, global shutter. There's so many things that are gonna change the way we take photographs and videos going forward in the next two to three years. It's gonna be mind blowing. So. While I understand everybody has their preference, let's just sit back as fans of photography and video and say, Sony, hats off to you. You did it. And as some people are saying, well, I wish it was more than 24 megapixels. You know, there is also the Alpha One. It's due for an update. Not saying I don't know anything, but Red just released an 8K high resolution global shutter. You don't think Sony has something in their pocket? Of course they do. Well, they put it out remains to be seen. Anyway, guys, those are my thoughts on the A93. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. This has been a long video. Thank you for taking time. If you got to this point, really appreciate it. I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. If you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. I have a special giveaway. Check out this video to find out more about that. Take care, stay safe, and I'll chat to you soon.